Welcome everybody to the War and Peace Fantasy Baseball Podcast. I'm here today with Alex Rudy, and I'm Alex Uwe. How are you doing today? I am quite content. Quite content. That's I like how every time we do this now, it's just finding different ways to phrase pretty good. And uh, at I'm least, glad you noticed. Thank at you. least at least you're making an effort. Like everybody's making an effort to to answer in a different way, even though the answer is essentially the same. Um, but I'll, I'll One take, time I'm just going to say, like, terrible, death. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, next question. Yeah. Let's get out of here. No, we're, it's always fun. It's, it's always, you, you can't be in a bad mood when you're talking about baseball. Exactly. Especially fantasy baseball, right? It, it tears your heart out, but it's, it's still super fun. And it's getting close to that time where, you know, head-to-head leagues are getting to their playoffs. And down the stretch, you gotta you got to get every last point you can in your points league and your categories and... Oh man, it's a rush. This is the best best time for fantasy baseball, is it not? Other than maybe the draft. Uh, if you're doing well. If yeah, you're doing definitely. well, some a lot of people are kind of uh, selling off all their pieces and already looking to next year's draft. I'll I'll probably be working on a new a brand spanking new set of rankings sometime soon. So. Um, yeah, that for all the for all those looking ahead to next season already, I know plenty of teams are. So hopefully you're still in it, and if you are, you'll enjoy some advice here. We'll go ahead and start by talking about the uh, probably the hottest man in the world right now in uh, in terms of hitting homers. Anyway, that would be John Carlos Stanton, and he just went off for number thirty nine today. That was off of Tanner Roark, but he's been hitting them basically every day. And that's kind of his deal. That's what he's gonna do when he's healthy, and he is for the first time in his career. Really, he's only missed two games this season. hasn't been on the DL, I don't think. So, what do you uh, what do you expect from Stanton in terms of you know in terms of health, in terms of performance? Is he gonna regress? Is he gonna stay on the field? What do you what are you worried about with Stanton, if anything? I am worried that he's a very scary big man that is crushing these baseballs just effortlessly yet so violently every other day and I am scared scared for all the pitchers facing the Marlins for the rest of the season but um, to really answer your question I don't think there's any reason to expect him to really slow down I mean this is what he's supposed to be he's fucking Giancarlo Stanton the Mike Stanton the player formerly known as Mike Stanton he has his own commercials we got you know, drop, drop, drop the mic, Stanton. I, I mean, he's he's this good. Um, for one, I'm thinking I'm the ultimate pessimist, especially when it comes to fantasy. But I really believe this is he's just this good, and I think he was always this good as long as he was going to be healthy for a whole season. And um, with these new balls, and um, you know, the mechanical adjustments players have been making with their uh, launch angles. He is as good as ever, and bearing an unforeseen catastrophic random injury, I suddenly see no reason for him to slow down, because all his injuries have been pretty random. They haven't been, like, um, repeated lingering issues or anything along those lines. They've usually just been unfortunate uh, results of the game, and that can obviously happen at any moment. But um, I think the really most interesting thing is that if you want to try to go to the advanced stats and maybe tell yourself there's a reason that uh, like he's just completely overperforming all expectations. Um, he's really not beating any of his um, stats in his, you know, normal, uh, like his standard healthy seasons by any um, significant margin. And that just goes to show, prove what I said earlier, that he's just this freaking good. Yeah, and I kind of will remain the Stanton pessimist. I think at this point he's a very clear-cut top 20 player. But I don't want to just dismiss his injury history completely because it hasn't happened this year. Um, you know, I think other than the, the getting hit in the face by a ball, that was the only kind of freak injury. The rest of them are just you know random little things which don't send him to the, the DL for months at a time, but it's just missing missing big chunks of the season consistently that that worries me and I don't think he gets a full pass on that in my book 
And obviously the man strikes out a lot, not as much as others, but he does go through stretches where he will just strike out a lot and then, you know, basically anything that's a mistake to him is going to leave the ballpark. But there's times when that hole in his swing, or if there, there might open up a hole in his swing where it's just really hard for him to make contact and he can go through stretches where he'll strike out an obscene amount, but he normally is corrected and... He is striking out less than ever before, though, this year. I, I guess, I mean, but that's that's already what to counter a pretty high strikeout rate. That's true. With, you know, I think, um, and you know, the, the also with um, fantasy baseball specifically, he, he's not really as good as he's been. He's not, you know, he's not been the best player in the last thirty days. Even he's he's up there in the the, the top twenty range. I'm not even sure if he's been top ten the last thirty days in a standard ESPN league. Let me see about that. Um, he is. He is not in the top. Oh, he's in the top ten. He's number nine in the last, in the last thirty days. Cons- considering how much homers. Weigh do you into think that. that has something to do with the fact that the Marlins are just a poor team? Overall? No, 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 no. I don't think so because his art, like the RBI and run production, are pretty on par with somebody okay. producing like that. It's just more to do okay. with he does. He's not dynamic in stolen bases, and his batting average leaves a lot to be desired. Still, Bas- like I said, anything he touches leaves the yard, but a lot of stuff he's not touching still um i still think though like i for example bought low on him before the season in a trade i think i gave up salvador perez and david price and in return i received stanton and um carlos rodon i believe is that his name yeah that's his name okay I don't... i'm speaking so i'm bad there's like a rondo and, and there's so many guys <laughs> i just wanted to make sure uh, I might have received actually one other player that I can't think of off the top of my head, but like that was definitely a trade I, I think I want is going to be either Salvador Perez is having still. I mean, um, I think you know buying low on Stanton uh, if you did choose that or drafted low on him also before this year, I think you feel um, very validated if you made that decision. Um, and I think you were going to see him get drafted much higher again next season. After this year, a lot of drafts saw him slip down quite a bit from where he was the previous three seasons. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely made that jump. Um, you know, just in terms of outfielders, he's he's probably... He has he's to be in the top, top five, ten. Yeah, he's, he's in the top ten for sure. Um, and like I said, I probably wouldn't take him in the first round, which is kind of where we wanted to put him in the previous years when like, oh when he gets healthy he's going to be a first round player and even now that he's healthy i don't think i'd put him in the uh the top he's a 10. high second round pick probably yeah like top, he's top, 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 ideally it, it kind of blends like, together in that range and that's i think i would ideally draft really him like second or third or first one through three in the second round mm-hmm. uh, in like a 10 person give or so league i think if i had the opportunity to but if you were to draft him late first, I don't think you could really go out of your way to criticize that either. Yeah, I I think that's the case, and I part of that has to do with I have you know three super pitchers that I'd take in the top yeah, 10, which 100%. is something I don't normally do with my rankings or my draft plan, but that has obviously changed considering the way the season's gone. So you know he is he is what he is. He hits for a lot of power. He strikes out a lot. I think the rest of the season he's a safe bet, so you don't have to worry about anything there. Um, yeah, that's a lot of talk for a player who's you know pretty definitively good. I think the players that are a little more questionable are the ones worth talking about. So let's talk about Yohan Moncada, who is unquestionably super talented and super athletic, but can he be a productive player this year remains to be seen, really. And we'll talk about him because he hit a game-tying home run today against the Astros and a walk-off uh, base hit up the middle. And that's a pretty nice night for the youngster, and I think that he has a lot more of that to offer, especially in the power side, which is what we haven't really seen to this point. So, Yon Moncada the rest of the season is going to be an interesting case mostly because of his speed but what do you what do you like about him for the rest of the season in particular because so far not so good for him 
Yeah, I mean, you're really just betting on his unbelievable talent. We saw it up close and personal at the um, Futures game last year, and it's undeniable that athletically and skill-wise, it's all there. He's 6'2", 220. He's, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's definitely not a small, light dude. Um, and, you know, I think we're very spoiled these days with um, – Players, young players, rookies, and expect them just to automatically perform the second they reach the big leagues and become superstars right away. I think expectations are higher level, uh, higher than ever before, and the, we don't have as much patience. But um, I think Putman Carr still has time to be productive this year. I don't know how high his ceiling can really be, but this is a guy with, you know, sixty grade power, seventy grade speed, and um, you know. There's no reason to believe that the talent can't show through at some point. The only thing that's kind of worrisome is that you know it's already August 11th, and you're kind of running out of time to be impactful fantasy wise. Um, you know, it's, if he's gonna make turn the corner, he needs to soon. Um, and looking at the like the, just like the advanced stats, I wouldn't say anything strikes out to me as particularly unlucky, but it's also hard to tell because there's so little. Um, so little of like uh, base to go off of. Yeah, I mean, so he has a hit in his last six games, at least a hit. Um, his first homer today hasn't stolen a base yet, which is probably the most concerning part of that. I don't think that's gonna last long. If you're worried about the lack of speed, there's he's a stolen base guy. He's not gonna just put the brakes on for the big leagues. He's gotta he's gotta show it off even even though he's playing for a team that's not going anywhere. Um, if it goes another week or so without him stealing a base, or even attempting to steal bases, then I'd be concerned that the White Sox management doesn't want him running, which would be really stupid, but it might be the case, because people are known to be stupid. Uh, I keep an eye on that. I guess they have nothing to gain by have... risking him getting hurt by stealing bases, I would say. Yeah, but they also don't have anything to lose because they need to see their player at his you know, full potential, and he's not going to do that by keeping training wheels on him. So you, yeah, I don't know, there, you can argue that from either side. From a fantasy perspective, obviously you want him to run. Um, I think it's worth keeping an eye on. I, don't, I think this is just, you know, first couple weeks it hasn't even been two weeks yet has it where um he's up and you know maybe he just hasn't hasn't felt right about getting those jumps quite yet i don't know there's, there's, I no, will there's say, no clear explanation for it i will say that the projections that the Angras are giving him for the rest of the season stat wise are nothing to brag about no because he is not a proven hitter in any way he's barely hitting 200 now on the season it's not He's not one of those rookies that'll burst out of the gates and really. He's not hitting everybody hard. He's not, you know, he's he's not coming out of the gates hot and you know slowly regressing from there. Hopefully, he does pick it up at some point. Might not be this season. We'll see. So, you know, with all this young player talk and the talk about us being spoiled by the talent that we see emerge. Right out of the gates, let's talk about somebody who might have been a little bit dismissed uh, at this point in the season earlier this year, and that's Alex Bregman, who's finally, finally doing it. He's doing the thing where he hits the ball really hard and runs the bases a lot. So he's he's been one of the top players in fantasy baseball recently, and all in you know just regular baseball too. He's really put it together. Everybody knew it was going to happen eventually, but people still weren't patient. They they hoped it would happen right out the gates. It, a couple months go by, he's still not really doing anything, not hitting for much power. Still not hitting for a ton of power, but doing a little bit better now anyway. But the last 30 days, number 12 player on the player raider, and he's since added shortstop eligibility, all the more reason to like him. I probably see him getting shortstop eligibility for... Uh, next season even, which would increase his stock quite a bit. So Alex Bregman, I I think I'm the one who's done a lot more research and close monitoring of his game 
But at first glance, is there anything that Bregman's doing better in recent weeks that stands out to you? Is there anything in particular that looks fluky? What What's your take on him? You know what? I mean, this guy is clearly talented, and um, I think, like you let off with, it's a great. He's another great example of pay, the whole patience thing and being spoiled with uh, the, the Mike Trouts and the uh, like his teammate Carlos Correa of the world just lighting the world on fire the moment they join, uh, you know, enter the majors. And you know, looking at his just advanced stats, um, there's no reason to. Um, you know, expect this to be him going back to um, this level as fluky. I think he really is this good and this talented. I think, considering how much you know about him, you could probably attest that. I think he can be a lot better because his power numbers are really down um, to what you would expect based on what he did in the minor leagues. And uh, I think he could could have had 20 home runs by now if he was hitting this way the whole season. And I don't know if he just needs confidence um, from the team in some way that Correa's injury helped create, give him an opportunity that <laughs> I, boosted him. I don't know I don't, that. Because it okay. seems kind of, but the timing is coincidental at the very least that he kind of seemed to heat up around the maybe, time that Maybe Correa he left. just hits better as a shortstop. Um, I don't yeah, I don't, I mean, it's pot, there are guys who've hit better at certain positions. And, uh, you know, he might just need this much time to adjust. I, mean, I think, you know, Dansby Swanson, um, it's kind of an interesting example of the counter where the team just sit, was just fed up with it and said, we got to send you some liners, bud. Like, you're not cutting it. And uh, he, Fregan was never doing that bad, but he definitely was nothing impressive, especially for uh, the second overall pick in a draft um, up until this point. But he's finally heating up. Um, what is his ceiling, though? Would you, I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you think? How good can he be? Well, I, th- I think his ceiling is not very much higher than what he's doing right now and that's really? nothing bad because he's doing really well right now uh i let me see what he's uh on the season now he's up to 276 batting average wise uh he has quite a bit of a hit streak going i can't count exactly how long it's been it's been 10 13 games in a row with a hit and multiple hit games in there as well of course the power's been better. He's hitting less ground balls, which is key to his game. I think it's a good mix, which is what I expect from him. A little bit of power, a little bit of speed. He's got 12 stolen bases now on the year as well. And the, just the contact ability, the hit and the raw hitting ability is what stood out the most for Bregman throughout his entire career. That's why he tore through the minor league so quickly. His strikeout-to-walk ratio is really good right now. I think it's something like 45 walks to 60 strikeouts, which for a young player is more than acceptable at this point. I think he has the potential to be a uh, you know one-to-one strikeout-to-walk person, which is really rare and extremely valuable in points leagues even. So with Bregman, I think it's fair to expect much of the same. I think he's still got some some spills in there where he can... Who's a comparable guy? If you had to name one player that he's most similar to. Stats-wise, I'd say Prime Ben Zobrist, maybe. Okay. I think that is probably where I'd land that comp. Not more power than that, I would say. Um... But a guy who really doesn't strike out a lot. So there's a, a jack lot. of all trades, complimentary, complimentary guy who, you know, if you nab in like the fourth or fifth round, it's gonna be very, mm-hmm. very solid for you. Yeah, m- might even sneak into. No, I think he's around the fourth, fourth, fifth round. That's pretty accurate, actually. So, Alex Bregman, you sh- everybody should own him at this point. What's his what's his percent ownership at this point in ESPN leagues? He is he's up to eighty four percent. He's one of the most added players recently as expected so Bregman is on the radar now officially um and I think he'll stay that way for the most part let's continue on here we have a trade to talk about waiver waiver trade finally happened you normally get one or two of those to pick out uh this one's pretty significant one that I think everybody was expecting and that would be Dre- Jay Bruce being traded. He is going to the Indians 
where you know, this kind of ties into something else we'll talk about with some of the significant injuries recently, but Michael Brantley is on the DL, so Bruce will play in his spot for the most part, or get his at-bats anyway. And then when Brantley's back, they can mix and match. Bruce can play first base also, give um, Santana a break or Edwin a break at DH. They have It's a good moving piece there. Uh, Jay Bruce is a first baseman, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Wait, what? <laughs> it's not common knowledge. He has gained eligibility at first base. He's been playing there for the Mets. Wow. Uh, I mean, it makes sense, though, the, the way the Mets have been playing. their outfield Definitely. with Conforto, Granderson, and Cespedes. I mean, somebody's got somebody's to gotta move. Um, so that's that's what's up with Jay Bruce. Not much different look for him there. He's he's going to slowly work his way towards 30 homers like he always does. Not slowly. He's 29 right now. Uh, quickly make his way to 30 home runs as he always does. Hopefully he pushes through a little bit more this year and pushes it closer to 40, which is... He should, he should be his he career high of 34, no problem at this rate. He should, but he's a, he's a streaky hitter by nature. Very true. Uh, a change of scenery isn't always a good thing. People like to say, oh, a change of scenery is good for this guy. I've never, I've never heard anybody say a change of scenery is bad for this player. Isn't that something interesting? Well, I feel like people never talk about it when the guy's just doing well or like what you expect. They always say if a guy's doing poorly, oh, maybe the change of scenery will help him. But you never hear them talking about how it will affect guys who are performing to expectations like Jay Bruce. Which is strange, I think. 100%. All the more reason to... I mean, I would say, like, when he changed teams from the Reds to the Mets, uh, he didn't perform any worse, so... No, he did, uh, actually. He was if... not very good when he came over to the Mets, if I recall, mm. in that first half season. I think that's exactly, that's exactly how it went. It took him a while to get across. That's... I mean, he had a great year so far, though, so... Well, this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make any... Uh, conclusions about Jay Bruce and how his hitter environment is going to affect him very much because he is very clearly the player he always has been. It's for a lot of power, not too much to offer batting average wise, but a solid player to have in the middle of your lineup on your fantasy team anywhere, really. Nothing changes with Bruce for me. I don't. I, mean, I think he should be better. He's going to a better lineup. So, I mean, you could probably tackle on a tiny bit of expectations value wise there and I mean City Field's a pitcher's park even though it seems like there's been a gazillion home runs hit this year. It's a good park for lefty power actually. I don't think Um, City's limited him too much there. But Jay Bruce is solid. Um, I really think this move is probably more impactful in real life than it is in fantasy Um, because I think Bruce just is a guy like you said he is what he is and this trade doesn't really change that in any way shape or form but if you need power, I mean, he's gonna play. He should play every game for them going forward. And there's no reason to really expect him to not hit at least somewhere between six and twelve home runs um, between now and the rest of the season. He should get a hundred RBIs, probably um, eighty to ninety runs total. So yeah. Uh, Michael Brantley is the time to part ways for the season. Obviously, dynasty leagues you still want to hang on to him. He is made out of glass, though. It's undeniable. I mean, I even do you see the injury? No, I, I didn't. Mean, it was pretty. I mean, I don't blame him for getting hurt, but he like got stuck in turf and is now on the ten day DL. And like, uh, that's not quite as bad as Johan Camargo's injury, where he like tripped walking onto running onto the field, and now is on the ten day DL. Wait, but, really? I did yeah, not hear about that. He was really like jumping over like the foul line. While running to short and rolled his ankle or something. Wow. Um, but he had two injuries of guys getting hurt on turf. But I mean, Brantley's hamstrings and ankles are just unbelievably fragile. Um, and I give him credit, honestly. He comes back from every injury pretty back to where he is. Um, but yeah, in a single season league, I don't think you can really rely on him going forward because who he takes forever to recover, it always seems like, from these small injuries. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of better players than him on the deal right now i would say he's um, really good in our keeper league for some reasons i'll never come well, because he doesn't strike out a lot yeah i guess that's the main it, reason it's that strike out to but, walk ratio that is very very helpful for uh 
and if you're, but he's a 30 year old player, so I don't even, I, who doesn't have any power to speak of. I don't really know how valuable he is going forward in any situation. And the, it's really only situations like our dynasty league that significantly rewards guys that don't have good walks to strikeout ratios. Mm-hmm. Um, where he, I think, at this point is very valuable, which is unfortunate for a guy of his caliber. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's, if you have room on your DL, you don't have to drop him because he is on the DL. So I think, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about a few more injuries here that happened recently. Michael Fulmer is probably the most shocking one. He went to the DL after his last start. Um, and pretty unexpectedly, he didn't leave that start early, if I recall. They placed him on the DL the day after, I want to he say. He got shelled, though, I know for sure. He did. It definitely seemed like something was bothering him. Mm, I don't know what to do with Fulmer for the context of this season. I'm going I'm to go ahead and admit it that I don't, I, I don't have the answers on this one. Apparently, recent reports say that he was feeling good throwing you know, just about 80 feet recently, the other day. But it was the first time throwing since he hit the, the DL since the end of July. Um, they expect him to rejoin the rotation soon. And I think it, the case can be made even when he comes back. Is he... He's an ownable pitcher probably, but second half Michael Fulmer of last year was nothing to behold either. He's probably barely a top 40 starting pitcher at this point in my books just based on you know his performance down down the stretch especially dealing with this kind of injury now doesn't help him much do you have any differing feelings about fulmer other than other than that uh so this mainly just in regards how valuable he is as a player going forward yeah, this season I don't in think the he's really his reg- his first year regression in the second half yeah. What do you? I don't know what. You I don't think, think he's that. very useful in fantasy going forward. To be honest, I I agree with you. The regression is like very noticeable, plus the injury, which, you know, he seems like one of these guys who like you ever notice like there's often a lot of times young pitchers have like a terrible start. Um, sometimes I don't know, or sometimes not, and then they get land on the DL with like some weird like upper dorsiness or like did you sore. Say, uh, like, did you say upper dorsiness? Yeah. <laughs> what like, is that a real thing? <laughs> I don't believe so. It's I wanna. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like sore, like sore, like uh, fingernail injuries, like sore, um, <laughs> sore fingernail. <laughs> like they, they, like, he seems like one of those where it's kind of like fuck, like you're gassed and you just got bombed. You need some rest, but we're not. We're uh, I'm gonna do your favor. Um, I mean, even like going into the start, like he was seems like I, I admit I wasn't following his season super, super closely. But just looking at what I remembered his stats being at kind of near, the, like, in June and what they are now, I mean, they're not really that impressive. I mean, 6.41K per nine strikeouts is, like, just not good in fantasy, to be honest. Um, the 10-9 and nine record, uh, you know, unfortunate that he plays on a mediocre team, but still nothing spectacular. Um, you know, 3.43 FIP, 4.11 XFIP is... Fine, uh, especially in this high run, this uh, high home run environment. Um, and I will admit, his seven point nine percentage home run to five ball rate is excellent in today's leagues. But there's not a lot separating from like Mike Leak, for example, for single season value. I would say, and I think in most leagues you could replace this production pretty easily. In Dynasty, I think he's a must keep, though. I mean, he's still a young pitcher who's been quite impressive so far in his career, and. At least in our main dynasty league, those guys are a dime a dozen. So that's how I would treat him. Dude, the, the upper the upper dorsimus is a anchorman reference. I don't think not from the. Told you it was. That's you, you. Oh, you did say that. Yeah, I said it was, was anchorman. Was that like in the movies? Yeah. Was that? Oh, I don't. I have no recollection of the. Uh... The context of that, I, I looked it up because he's working I, out in his uh, office in front of Veronica, and he's like one thousand one, one thousand two. Yes, okay. And he's like, and they have a whole argument about tickets to the gun show, and he's like, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm just, you know, the upper dorsimus sore, sore, it's sick yeah, burn. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, 
word for word, you have you have your ubulus muscle that connects to the <laughs> upper dorsum, dorsinus. It's boring, but it's part of my life. Exactly. <laughs> so it's my, it's my hero. I guess so. Yeah, that's that's a very I deep, would ideally deeply rooted be, reference right there. I like I that. I would say, like, ideally, I would be the Ron Burgundy of sports if I could be anything. I mean, Will Ferrell exists in sports because he did that 30, 30 clubs in one day thing. Probably so, one of the best things I've ever watched my entire life. If so I guess he's... If you've seen this podcast and have not seen that, you better watch that. So I guess he's also the... The Ron Burgundy of sports, though, if, if you were to say that. I would like to be his acolyte, then. He is from our high school <laughs> as well, so it was meant to be. I'm going to email him immediately. Yeah, that actually is true. He's he's our most prized alumnus from our high school. Um, come on the show, Will, if you love baseball. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> we were talking about injuries, right? <laughs> that's that's where we were. Uh, Wilson Contreras oh, and Salvador yes. Perez. Yes, uh, sp- very specific movie reference injuries. These these injuries are real, as far as I know, uh, with Wilson Contreras and Salvador Perez. Two catchers, two top five catchers, very definitively top of the top of the line catchers that are missing some time here. It does not look like it's going to be the rest of the season, so it's a tricky spot because catcher is not a strong position at all past. I think the the top tier right now, which is pretty agreed upon in the fantasy baseball world, would be, you know, these two guys we mentioned, Contreras and Perez, and Buster Posey, Gary Sanchez, JT Real Muto is in that tier, I think, still, and maybe Yadier Molina, just due to how how much he plays. He's still hitting well this year. Tip of the cap to that guy. He will not... Slow down. He Yachty, keeps, Yachty not tired. He's That's immortal. I think the uh, Benji and uh, uh, what's his, the other brother's name? Shoot, Jose. Jose just gave them, gave him like their life force. Well, they're so older, that they're older than career. him, also though. Their life force, though. They're older, also though. You know, I think Yachty is about the same point. It looks. He, he definitely looks. He's like a thirty-five-year-old catcher who's still hitting at a pretty yeah. Solid the rate. the That's bat very is very impressive. pleasant. And how healthy he's been this year is pleasantly surprising also. He's definitely not feeling feeling great out there on the baseball field every day. Like he says he is. I don't care what he says. That's his, That's a gamer mentality right there. You know, you got to have that to the very bitter end. But Yachty is not the same Yachty. I think we'll take the Yachty we have, especially because he's still hitting at a pretty extraordinary rate. Especially recently, he hit, a, he hit a grand slam the other day to give them the lead. He's been hitting more, more homers than we're used to. Even when he was when he was good, he he'd been for the most part, you know, a batting average guy, and sprinkles a few homers in there. And just the fact that he plays every day is what really boosted his value, and it still does. Um, but beyond that tier of catchers I just mentioned, there's nothing special at all. Is it worth letting go of? If you own one of these guys, just let him go, play it by ear the rest of the way with uh, whatever catcher's hot at the time. Or do you, Definitely you know, try not. to stash and hopefully they can help you in September down the Contreras stretch? Contreras isn't even on the DL yet in, in ESPN. He's going to miss so. three to four weeks uh, is the report. Well, I will say this. If you're like in a tight race and you have no more DL spots, you are boned, my friend, to <laughs> That, I mean, if it's a single-season league, I guess you might as well do it because I doubt anyone's going to pick them up while they're on the waiver wire, but it's a pretty risky move. Uh, there are some options that are not terrible, but the biggest issue is that they're all platoon guys. Kurt Suzuki, Wellington Castillo, um, Tyler Flowers, they all are productive, but they don't play every day. Um, so... You know, the, the, you also you have to take into calculated risk if there, um, compared to guys like you know Alex Avila, I assume is going to play um, while Contreras is out, and while he has fallen way, way, way back to earth, he will get that everyday playing time. Um, Austin Hedges hits some has some power, as does uh, Grandal and that Weeders, but they are Mike and, Zunino and too. Mike Zunino. All those guys hit home runs, but they really do nothing else. Um, you know, you could always just be someone who just believes that 
uh, Russell Moore and Jonathan Lugroy and Travis D'Arno will finally start playing like they should be talent-wise this year, but nothing so far That's has demonstrated that that will happen. Russell Moore has third base eligibility, by the way, which is I must admit is unbelievable. Blue Jays um, are having fun. There, anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, there is not a lot uh, of options. Christian Vasquez is another great platoon option. I mean... I would say the ideal way to do it would be to pick up two of these platoon guys and just hope that they. No, I don't think if you're playing in a one catcher league, I don't think you want to pick up if two you're, catchers. If, if you're really chasing the championship, yeah, I that think, that roster space is super right, valuable right, in most leagues. But if leagues. you if you hypothetically had like a p- extra position player already on your team on your bench, I think it would be worthwhile. I guess actually no, because catchers no, are just I, so bad. No, no, compared no, no, to no, 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 wait, I rethought not. the logic. Ignore me. I should, I should be kicked off the podcast. You shouldn't. All cut right. The call. That was, that was well, a bad. Have a good strategy. night. I'll take. I'll take it from here. But I think it does prove the point that you were trying to make is that the pickings are very slim. So what? Let me ask you then. What would you do if you had no DL spots? And well, I would uh, keep them. Were, I would keep that void space for a little while. You would while. just play no catcher. There's scenarios where I would. So the scenarios where I would basically all include either having. Um, a playoff format which spans September. I would definitely want to hang on to them and have them oh, for that definitely. playoff stretch. That's that, yeah, a hundred percent. In points leagues, for the most part, I would I would hang on to them a bit longer. And part of that's because it's not extremely clear on their return time at this point. Um, you know, Salvador Perez, it's not really exact the timetable for him it could be a week or two it could be you know three to four weeks which i think is what it looks like for Contreras. Contreras is a hamstring injury which normally takes a little bit longer so yeah, either way you go there i i definitely want to hang on to them even in a points league because that one month could be <laughs> twice as valuable as any of these other platoon guys you mentioned over the span of two months. So it's just that week of a position, really. I, You know, a lot of these names you mentioned are good if you don't own one of these top six catchers, even. So, Would you consider trying to trade for one of the other healthy top catchers? No, no, you can't really trade for catchers. It's really hard to do that. Well, if it was a team that was had no shot of winning the championship, you could offer the one of the hurt could. catchers. It'd be easier in a in a dyna, in a in, yeah in a dynasty league. It'd be a little easier, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's it's catcher. It's not it's not a very important position, to be fair. You know, Buster Posey is the number one player on the player radar right now for the season. Uh, the last thirty days, it's been Contreras. Contreras has been really good since the all-star break by the way which is a really really big shame that he's gone because he was one of the top players let alone catchers in that span but even even posey is not in the, on the season if you were to guess where he is on in a standard espn player raider um just among among hitters even try and try and um so this is position players only yeah uh, I need to look up Buster Posey's stats because off the top of my head, I do not. I'm not aware. I know he's doing well, but I am not sure exactly how well he's doing. Um, mm, top f- four thirty, top thirty five. Um, no, he's top not. forty. I don't know. He's not in the top forty. He's not in the top fifty. Uh, I don't believe so, actually. Really? I mean, he's having not that. But he's having a pretty good year, even. No, he's I mean, not. He's he's sixty-one. Really? Sixty-one in the player rater. For wow. I mean, he's hitting three twenty-one. That's you would think with you know. And that's most of his value right there. That's that's. A he has a hundred RBI runs combined. I mean, I I mean I I guess I mean the the Giants kind of ruined his value for the season quite yeah. a bit. I would say he's a spot. I don't... He's a spot ahead of Milky Cabrera and a spot behind Yasiel Puig. Is another player who's dealing with some. Some minor injury troubles. I mean, we'll talk about let me ask second. you this though, just hypothetically, if he played for say, not even like the Astros, but if he played for like, uh, um, I don't know, give me like what's like a average offense team, 
if, if he was, I mean, if he was hitting like the Royals, I don't know. The Royals don't know. or something. Do you think he'd be like top? We think he would be within the top fifty. So here's then? the thing: I'm not. I don't think the lineup context is the important thing with Posey. I think the fact that he plays in 18D Park really hurts him because he's not hitting for any power. Okay, essentially. so if he played for a different team, that would also help that then. Well, it depends on the ballpark. I would also say that having that little bump from the lineup support would be nice, but it's not going to make or break it for me. Uh, you know, Buster Posey just is what he is, and the fact that he doesn't steal is not going to steal bases isn't going to boost his, you know, rating all that much. The batting average is the best part about his game, and it always has been. It's just that when he can hit for some decent power also alongside that, that's when he elevates himself to being that, you know, that top-level player. So that's just, that's just a little context for where catchers are, really. Um, not a good place. In terms of that. Not not a good place by any means. So, Yasiel Puig is a guy I mentioned. He's one spot ahead of Posey on the player rater for the season, in fact. Who has had a very surprisingly nice year. Uh, right now is day-to-day with hamstring and knee issues. Sore knee and hamstring. He's out of the lineup. Four, and that's just a day-to-day thing. But it's Yasiel Puig also who is probably the most famous hamstrings in all of L.A. at the very least. So he has really had trouble staying on the field in the past due to minor issues like this. Well, it it, it could very well turn into something more. It's not right now. I'm not going to speculate that it is something more. I think that's a good reality check on Puig uh, to to show, you know, even if he is doing the things that we expect we to do, just hitting for power and stealing bases, and, you know, being the, the more complete player that we all want, he's still a pretty brittle player, and that's not something to be ignored. Um, does that affect the way you look at Puig at all? I know he's been very pleasing to most people, especially Dodgers fans. These last I fucking months. love Yasiel Puig just on the field. There's no doubt. Few guys entertain me more. But like fantasy wise, he's like very difficult to gauge. And a big reason that is is because he was so unbelievably effing good when he first came to major leagues, and he's clearly never going to reach that level ever again. And you know. I mean, you t- like, I just don't see anything that he does that like jumps out to me like, wow, like this helps my team a lot. I mean, I guess he's a balanced home- player. He's a very balanced. Twenty one home runs is pretty good for a right fielder. I mean, he's definitely wrong with that, but he's just like a guy that you know. I don't know. He doesn't. He, I don't think he has much upside at this point. I don't think cool. he's gonna break out the rest of the season and you know end up with much better stats than this in any category. He's fine. I don't no, nothing special to me. I feel like there's uh, you know 15 guys uh, with that you can easily get around his level of uh, production personally. Yeah, there's plenty of outfielders out there. Absolutely. I've seen like 15 like waiver wire guys in most. Yeah, even so. then, there's so many outfielders out. Yeah. outfielders available out there, so it's not a big deal. You, it's it, un- I think he has the ability to be way better, though, but yeah. it, I don't think it'll ever really happen at this point. We're not saying drop him either, because this could be nothing. I just want people to keep that in mind when they get excited about the prospects of Puig in the future and saying he's he's ready to become the star player he's meant to be. Maybe not so much quite yet. So we'll see, though. He's still you know, trying to figure things out. One last injury I'll throw in here is James Paxton, who left his start today. Actually, I don't know if he left this. Yeah, I think he did leave the start with uh, pectoral discomfort. Uh, They're calling it a left pectoral strain, which is something I don't really know how it affects pitchers or their timelines in that regard. I don't know if it'll be, you know, missing a start or two starts or a few weeks. I have no idea. I, in this, for the sake of keeping it fantasy baseball relevant, we won't talk very much about how screwed the Mariners are as a team. They lose Paxton, but if you lose Paxton as a fantasy owner, that's a pretty big deal because he's been fantastic. Definitely in my top 10 pitchers at this point. Um, 
Yeah. Any any other praises to sing about James Paxton in the meantime? I mean, it's if he's really out for any kind of period of time, it's devastating to any team that owns him. That could significantly change the course of your fantasy season. Um, but if he's back, I mean, he's a top five pitcher in the AL, um, guaranteed, and a top seven pitcher in baseball. So, so seven. <laughs> I'm, so seven. I'm, yeah, I was trying to. I mean, I'm thinking like there's obviously Kershaw. Scherzer, Sale, Kluber, um, is Paxton the fifth guy after those? Am I forgetting someone very obvious? Well, considering how he's pitched the last month, you could make that case, absolutely. You could still include guys like uh, DeGrom, who also left his start today with something. I, I'm not sure. I don't think that's another minor thing that DeGrom left to start for. You could make the case for him. He's been really dominant recently also. You can make the case for Darvish, a really good strikeout pitcher. I mean, Zach Greinke is still pretty awesome. Um, Severino yeah. is flying under the radar. I don't I think Severino is like. going to crack that top five argument quite yet. but His stats um, are closer to Paxton, though, than you may think if you really just compare the basic Oh, I, be- I believe uh, it, absolutely. Ones. Um, he's, but Paxton's a fucking beast, and people have been... Um, all the smart people like you have been calling it for a couple of years now, and he's finally been healthy enough um, in one season to prove it. But the guy is made out of glass, I think, more than anything. It's undeniable. And a pitcher made out of glass is just a worrisome combination overall. Just, just, total just glass. Just I do. I really glass. cannot. Like, it really worries me. As good and talented clearly is the fact that he just never fucking stays healthy for a particularly long period of time. Um, I think this might be his third trip to the DL this season alone, even though they've all been minor injuries. It's definitely a second, I'm pretty sure. Um, and this has like a, been a healthy season for him. Um, that says a lot about his body's ability to handle the workload. Yeah, and injury history kind of suggests that. But when he's on the field, he's he's doing it right. He's doing the work. So that's... Pretty much all injury wise. Aaron Hicks is back for the Yankees. That's exciting. Um, Finally. Yeah, it's about time. And he's going to take Clint Frazier's spot on the roster for the time being. Clint's also dealing with a a bleak injury, I think. So their outfield should be relatively unaffected. Um, They still carry four outfielders that, in my opinion, essentially have to play every day. That might get tricky. But. I think they're flexible with DH right now too. Holiday's dealing with stuff. So he'll play. He'll play every day for the Yankees. And should we be optimistic and say Hicks is going to do what he did um, before he went on the deal? Dude, I literally have no idea what's going to happen. He hit incredible in his rehab stint. I don't know if that means anything either. No, it doesn't, it doesn't mean He's anything. a total You're wild correct. card player. I mean, that's he's a wild card. I mean, I, do you disagree with that? I, don't, I really don't feel like as a Yankee fan I'm any more qualified to predict his production going forward than anyone else. I mean, this guy's history is just so all over the place and inconsistent and full of... He's as talented and as athletic as anyone, but who knows after, you know, being away from his hot spot, his hot start for this long, if he can maintain that form. Yeah, and he's 0 for 5 in his first game back. It's a good sign, right? I mean, the whole Yankees got shut out, to be fair, today, so I'll give him, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Benefit of doubt. Yeah, I'm not looking at one game either. Hicks is good. I, you know, there's so many outfielders out there. He's not a must own by any means. So, yeah, we'll right, talk about. Nice guess, though. If you have, who do you want going forward? Assuming Puig is healthy, Puig or Hicks? Uh, Puig, probably Puig. At this point, I mean, they're both similar types of players. Pretty balanced. Hit for power, steal some bases. Puig's just been doing a little better. And, you know, Hicks has been really good in, like, a points league. I'd definitely rather have Hicks. His his on-base percentage has been way better than expectation. But in a regular league, probably still Puig. That's, that's my take there. That's fair. Yeah. So let's go ahead and move into our little segment of Here to Stay or Keep Away, which is something we do pretty much every week where we talk about a few players and their prospects going forward. So Joey Gallo is probably, if Stanton is the hottest home run hitter on the planet, Gallo's 
a close second because he's homered in what seven of his last 10 games or something like that it's ridiculous what this guy's doing right now he is up to how many homers is gallo up to why don't i know this um he's up to 32 on the season now he's homered in three straight uh three straight in two different stretches in the last there's so many different ways to word it he's hitting homers every day though and joey gallo was kind of dismissed earlier this season even though he's hitting a lot of homers people you know were dropping him in leagues because batting average was just tanking way too much uh, wasn't making him a good option playing time wise for the rangers so now that he's homering every day again looking like a pretty good option he's back up to around 50 percent owned in espn leagues joey gallo going forward and even for next year because this is important for a guy like gallo is the power going to be enough to carry the dead weight he brings with the batting average? No, in most leagues, I have to say. Uh, I don't think he is a unownable player going forward at all by any means. Um, I think he can still bring you value, but I don't think he's at this rate ever going to be a guy that's more than just like replacement level in fantasy unless... He significantly um, becomes a more balanced uh, player. So you're kind the, of you're kind of Chris Cartering him. I mean, at this point in his career. I think I th- that's a pretty comparable guy. Chris Carter last year hit 44 home runs or something. He led the NL in home runs, and I would really be curious to see how, what percentage um, he was owned in ESPN uh, in the leagues or ESPN leagues last year. I'm sure it was not it was nothing special, and I like Gallo as a guy. I think he's very talented. But I think there's only very specific formats where he's anything more than just a, a filler guy because m- most leagues are going to significantly uh, reprimand you for how poor, like how severely he hurts your average OBP and strikeout uh, statistics. Oh, well, he walks enough to make his OBP not super detrimental still hits I mean, with an obp of 325 which isn't good but it's not as detrimental as let's say a sub 200 averages which is what he's had for most of the year it's up to 212 now um but that's a really good power bat right there and he's 23 years old it, I, I i don't know if i'm ready to just say that gallo is what he is and he'll be a potential 45 he, he, he could be chris davis the orioles and just no have the, what do you mean what do you mean this would be a lot he would have to raise his barrier of like 50 points to get to pete chris davis on the orioles i mean just with I'm, I'm talking about as a player each year he has the prospects of hitting 45 to 50 homers if he puts enough balls in play but you know there's a bunch of years mixed in there like every other year where Chris Davis just wasn't doing that enough throughout the course of the season to me he's a guy that you want to trade to someone who can fool into convincing that he's better than he really is because he has flashy numbers but they really don't translate much in most fantasy uh, into much fantasy value in my opinion well 61 runs scored 61 RBIs 32 homers definitely do translate in a lot of leagues at this point in the season, he's he's turned himself into a pretty good. I I I, I, I just right now. How many saying. leagues are there really? Okay, but he's having an absurdly hot stretch. Like this is ridiculous. Like no one, he would be the greatest that's player. That's what he does. He's a streaky if he, player. That's not good in fantasy. You don't want streaky no, but players. You, you don't want, want streaky you want hitters the numbers. Especially. You want the num. You want him to be on your team when those numbers are getting put. I, but that's not how fantasy works. That's just I don't. Who plays that? You don't stream hitters. You don't know when their streaks work that way. It's just luck, and I don't know. Maybe that's just how my I view it. Well, but yeah, but I think I'm very, uh, very opposed to for rely that, on guys for like that, that very reason. And I, I don't know what league exists. I've never seen one where his detrimental disadvantages are minimized enough where you can get over the fact that he is just a lottery ticket and just a slot machine of a player. I'm going to go ahead and say that for the reason that you just I, mentioned, that you can't well, really predict hot hot hands of hitters and whatnot um, down to the T. When you 
encounter players that you want, you stick with them because you know the ups and downs are coming and you want to stick with them just to get the full season numbers if you're confident that that player will reach that point. Uh, and it's hard to do. It's hard to be patient with players, uh, especially with a player like Gallo, who can be incredibly streaky. And even when he's a hot hitter like this, isn't really going to provide you anything additional in batting average. He's not, in the last 30 days, he's not dragging you down batting average wise, but he's certainly skyrocketing you with those home run numbers. Like, there's no denying that part. Um, you know, in the I last think... the last thirty days, he's the second. He's the second best in that category. That's one category. category That's an though. important Look, category. Listen, I'm not saying he's a bad player. All I'm saying is that he's average at best. He has a significant cap on his value. Listen, I literally was going to add him today just to write out the hot streak because I needed a, a utility hitter, um, and I received some extra acquisitions, but in a trade, but. That doesn't mean I think he's... All I'm saying is he's not the next Giancarlo Stanton who we talked about earlier. He, this is, at the moment, all he is. And that kind of player is only so good. There is a significant ceiling to a guy who can only subsist on one carry. Why is he... He's no better than Billy Hamilton, is what I'm trying to say, at the moment. Billy Hamilton's really good. <laughs> I don't know. Only in certain leagues, though. You're acting anywhere, like, anywhere where stolen bases counts. He's just really not good. true. But okay, but we. <laughs> I'm just in, in a points league, Billy Hamilton sucks. So, like, I think you have like this idea that like, just because a guy is good in rotisserie, he's good in all fantasy leagues. That's just not true. I didn't say that. I I didn't say Bill. I, I said anywhere stolen bases affect have, well, a, have an impact. Every league, league is really good. Every league counts stolen bases, I assume, 98% as some form of attribute that you can use, but it's only in situ- in category leagues where these guys um, where these guys' profiles are very uh, helpful, where their true value um, can be maximized. And I, I, in my opinion, in most formats, they're very limited. I don't think Billy Hamilton is really that on, good. Hamilton's mostly. on base percentage is abysmal, and obviously doesn't slug exactly. at all. Exactly. But those are those are leagues that would involve on base and slugging, which a lot of points leagues do. Not necessarily all points leagues do, but you know Hamilton is not. He is definitely a, an above average player. I think at this point. And I'm not going to go ahead and reference the ESPN player rater. But I mean, because it's it's very clear that in the standard league he's super valuable. Um, he's the number thirteen hitter on the player rater, which is st- stupid. He's above Mike Trout right now, <laughs> like on the season. I know Trout missed a lot of time, but that's what that's what it that's what it does. That's how far ahead he is. Joey Gallo is category. No, uh, Hamilton. You're, Billy Hamilton's you're thirteen in all of fantasy baseball in the ESPN player. No, all player rater. All hitters. All hitters. But that's still. I, I do not understand that. I just don't get it. It's because well, let's let's see, let's, let's 40, because all just because he has he's forty five stolen he's bases, forty five stolen bases. But it's the fact the disparity is so great in stolen bases. If I take a look at the stolen base leaderboard, it has to do with the you know the quantity of steals there are in baseball today, and it's much much lower than the the power numbers as. I, 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 maybe I'm just biased because I don't play in leagues that like give that much value to stolen base to single category. That's definitely why, but a but, lot of leagues do. Okay, then that's just maybe that's just why I have this opinion of this way because I never have played in leagues where like I I mean I I do see like like we're in a categories league and I do see how Billy Hamilton would essentially single handedly win stolen bases for the entire season this year. But Gallo definitely doesn't do that because there's a fuck ton of home runs. There's so, yeah, season. there's so much power. So in this if anything, game right he's now. he's a significantly that just hurts him even more, honestly. Because if this is like an era where everyone's just hitting 20 home runs, like it's nothing. It feels like so Gallo's the rest of Gallo, you know, all of Gallo's deficiencies are even more obvious because um, you know, obviously 34, whatever you said, is still a very a very large amount for August 11th, but. Um, compared to like three or four years ago, where that could have led a league in home runs for the season almost, um, that's just not as noteworthy. Yeah, and it, I, I just want to comment. You're, you the definitely trumped me on Hamilton, though. That you crushed yeah. me on that. I was and I wrong. think I think the thing is in points league too is, yeah, obviously stolen bases, in in points league stolen bases drive him from an 
an unownable, awful player to being a barely average player, because stolen bases do count in points leagues too. Um, and in normal leagues, they drive him from, they just drive him to the top of that that rating because he has forty five. D Gordon has forty. Trey Turner, who's injured, has thirty five. Nobody else has above 30 stolen bases. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 players with 20 even. And then everything else with that is just, you know, whatever. It is what it is. There's so many fewer stolen bases just in the game of baseball. Um, so that's where a lot of that value comes from. And that has nothing to do with Gallo, really. But I think Gallo's an intriguing player, nonetheless. Because I think it's still a worthwhile he's so young. comparison. Though. I just want I want him to get a little bit better. I think he can get to to be Chris Davis the way he was in the Orioles when he was hitting fifty homers. I think that's a very realistic outcome based on what I've seen. Um, do you yeah, think that the approach to tight the just outside of fantasy for a second? Do you think the approach that the Rangers are giving letting him take is the correct one going forward for him? Would you be this? Would you, if you were running the Rangers, would you let them be this um, loose on the reins with his approach? Do you think? It, yes. Just do you think it needs to get better at it? Still strikes out way too much. Is is well, then, his approach is three true outcomes: is to either walk, hit a homer, or strike out. And he's there's just the, the balance is not there. He's striking out way too much. So do you think that's possible? If, you he, think if he turns you, if he turns it around and starts walking more then if he can lay off more pitches out of the zone and if he is his swing is super violent but if you know they tell him they, they i'm not saying that he shouldn't keep trying to hit home runs i'm just saying if he can learn how to dial his swing back to a point where he can lay off pitches that he, there's no chance of him hitting then that yeah if, if that comes with experience sure he can he can definitely be successful with the plate of he has a lot of the great hitters really do hit this way and it helps their it helps their batting average it helps their their other numbers as well i think jose bautista is pretty darn close to when he was really good is pretty um close to a three true outcome guy because that was his approach he anything you leave me in the zone i'm trying to hit out of the ballpark um and i just won't swing at anything anything else you throw me um so yeah you can definitely use that approach you just got to get better at it i think you can um yeah so let's talk about a couple more players here and here's their giveaway one of them's hyunjin ryu who is pitching really well for the dodgers uh, it's not a surprising thing to say a player is doing well for the dodgers right now but ryu has been exceptional in his last couple starts um he's he's been uh really making a push to stay in that Dodgers rotation that's getting kind of crowded there with you Darvish. So, uh are you if you're if you're still with me, I'm not I'm not sure if uh, Skype dropped out or something. Nope, I'm still here. Okay, I wasn't I wasn't sure. Sometimes it happens. Um yeah, uh, Hyunjin Ryu coming off of a pretty nice stretch of starts, two consecutive scoreless seven inning starts in fact. Um do you think he has a place with the Dodgers going forward? I mean, the rest of the season, he probably does. But even after that? After the season, you're saying? Yeah. I mean, after the season, I think there's no way to know because they have, like, seven starting caliber pitchers uh, they, like on the roster. Um, they have still a couple of guys in the minors that are pretty good. Ryu has another deal, contra- uh, year on his contract, which... I don't think it really means anything. He only makes uh, six million dollars a year, honestly. So they would, I could honestly even see them sticking him in the bullpen next season. Um, I wouldn't be surprised because it makes no difference to the Dodgers. So next year, I would not be super confident. It's really considered that he's like by far one of the most fragile players I've ever seen in any sport. I mean, he literally did not play for two years, um, basically at all. But his numbers this year are good. There's like no w- other way to put it. They're it's a pretty high they're, whip. Is the only concern. they're pretty good. Is the only uh, concern I have. Yeah, I mean, like we saw him pitch in person, and I think that that supports everything. But that, but his whip um, is good. One point two eight is not great, but it's in within his career averages, give or take. So um, it's kind of what to expect. 
he uh, gets you, you know, all the other categories at yeah. a decent clip. I mean, he's, I, I, he's good. He's nothing special. He isn't going to win you a league. I think going forward, he's a might be. A, I, I, I'd probably stream him. I would say he's probably a really good streaming option. Yeah. Going forward. I do want to say, but if he like stubs his toe and dies, like I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> like worst case scenario. <laughs> Um, so he's, not, he's basically an oot player. I mean, to be completely honest, like injury wise, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, I will say that you know an okay good pitcher on a fantastic team does elevate him to a you know above average fantasy option. I think you got to use him if you if he's out there, you should pick him up because he's only owned in forty five percent of leagues. I want as many Dodgers pitchers as I can right now because they're going to win so many games. Um, even, you know, Kent Maeda, who's been up and down this year, you definitely want him on your team just because of that Dodgers bump. He's going to get, he's going to win some games there. Um, you know, Alex Wood's been fantastic and he's winning every single game, which is really where a lot of his value is coming from, you know, even though the rest of his numbers have been good. But it, it takes it to that next level when you're playing for a good team like that. I think that's the thing the thing to keep in mind with Ryu um long term who knows really he doesn't have much of a place with the Dodgers he doesn't have a place in their postseason rotation probably either so that should be interesting to watch another guy another pitcher I want to talk about is Colin McHugh who for the Astros in his last start gave up seven earned runs but for the most part is not a guy that's going to give up um you know five runs every time he goes out he's a pretty good pitcher he's pretty effective considering his stuff isn't electric he's a you know big curveball user um are you are you liking Miku? this is another argument with the uh the you know okay pitcher on a really good team for the most part so yeah i didn't even think of it like that that was like an amazing point that you brought up and i think that's like 90 percent of these guys is not valuable like what makes them interesting honestly uh right now is that they're playing for teams that score are scoring a ton of runs and just winning a ton of games. And I'm not sure exactly what like their strength of schedule is going forward, um, but I pretty much had the same thing to say about McHugh as I do about Ryu, same guy. I'm not happy about any pitcher getting lit up by the White Sox of all teams, but it's not great. you know it's for not the great. most part. He's he's not been great. He's not been good this season at all. He's a five three two ERA, and a WHIP of one three six, which is too high for a guy like that. Um, I think for the most part he's the same kind of pitcher though. He's not gonna walk a lot of batters. He he has walked, um, you know, a, a few batters in the four starts he's made this year. But as long as he's pitching. You know, down in the zone, getting getting a lot of contact out, and you know, five five to seven strikeouts along the way, and a quality start win pretty much every every time out. I think that's really valuable going forward, and the yeah. numbers right now don't make him look very valuable. I think I like Ryu better than him um, for this season, but weirdly going forward, I might actually like make you better, um, just because he has been excellent in the past. And this year, while he did was out for a very long time, before that he was a decently uh, healthy pitcher, and um, his 2015 was like very, very good. And if he replicate that going forward, I mean, uh, it'd be an extremely valuable player. Though I do believe he might be a free agent after the season. That might be. He might be. He might be still in arbitration, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. I will say these guys both have very not concrete roles in the future. Um, but I think would you like who would you take right now for the rest of the season? You have to pick one between Ryu and the Q. Rest of the season, um, probably I'd probably take Ryu. Yeah, I would um, too. I think. I'm I'm not happy. Uh, I'm no, I'm not happy. I definitely wouldn't use him in his start next week against Arizona, which is an interesting interleague matchup. So it, it's always homework. I, I wouldn't use Ryu really in it. You know, Colorado or Arizona either. To be fair, so what about for next season? 
Oh, for next season? I don't I'm just, know. I'm, I didn't mean for, I'm saying... Neither of them are keepers. Yeah, definitely. By any means. Who would I have higher in, you know, rankings for next season? It's probably McHugh, just more rotation security. Yeah. Um, that's the only definitely. reason, really. I don't know what Dodgers rotation is going to shake out to look like. Rio might miss out on starts. So, yeah, I think that's... Uh, we oh wait, I have one more here. We'll talk about him real quick. Keon Broxton is back with the Brewers, um, and that's about the only news. He's homered a couple times since he's returned, and this is still a player who, even despite being sent down to the minor leagues for what was it, a couple weeks, still might finish with a 2020 season in homers and steals, which is valuable in and of itself. But Keon Broxton is kind of concerning to me because. The Brewers clearly don't like his bat. Um, <laughs> they they don't like the kind of production you get with a guy who's not going to put the ball in play enough. He's hitting 220 on the year. That's just not going to cut it in uh, for most teams, especially a team that's contending. So I can see playing time possibly cutting into that, um, it, cutting into those numbers, which makes him a little less attractive. Uh, would you pick him up in an ESPN league or any league? Um, really, I think there's more options out there that are better than Broxton at this point. Probably not, but I really like him actually for next season. And can I tell you why? Yes, please. As like a under the radar sleeper, his BABIP is 326. Um, so I believe that means he should be uh, hitting at a much higher clip Th- than he is. That's that's like the opposite, though. He's The BABIP is, you know... A oh, you're bit right. On the higher side, his average is only 220. Oh no, you're right. I mean, he's getting really lucky, right? And his average is uh, super low still, right? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, he needs to cut down the strikeouts. Regardless, the, the most important thing is as I was going to say next is that um, his strikeout to walk ratio is like terrible for a guy who's only has 15 home runs on and 101 games this year. I mean, that's like unacceptable yeah. and atrocious, but. The tantalizing prospect of a guy who can run this much and hit this much, this many yeah. dingers. I mean, it's the classic BJ Upton paradox. It is. It's... If he can pull it off, I mean, you're getting a Lorenzo Kane with more, slightly more, you're getting peak Lorenzo Kane. I, uh, more there's powerful, no way he's going to pull off the batting average more of Lorenzo Kane. Aver- yeah, more powerless average, but. The chance of him ever being that player seems he's, very unlikely. He's a talented kid. In the, the weird he's not thing a kid, is, he's twenty-seven years old. He's a talented twenty-seven-year-old <laughs> youngster. So, <laughs> the thing about Broxton is he swings and misses at a lot of balls in the strike zone, and he'll still he still knows how to take a pitch and take a walk. Uh, it's it's not, it's, he's just he's not able to make contact on pitches in the zone for some reason at a very high rate, and hopefully that changes as he, you know, gets a little more experience, but. I'm not going to bank on it. I think there's other, you know, short-term options that you can get. If if it is in fact a short-term option that you need and he's available, I still probably take him over a guy like Rajay Davis. Probably. Oh, definitely. If he needs, if, I, you'd only really want him if you're chasing steals mostly. Even then, though, at least he's giving you like your power. I mean, if you are chasing think, steals, like the Rajay two Davis fifty, two thirty-five that Rajay Davis hits is not like a big enough improvement over the two hundred. That uh, Keon Broxton might hit going forward for to justify not taking the guy who has more power. Yeah, I'm I'm talking more specifically if you're chasing steals and you. Need I an know, outfielder. but if you're chasing steals, you might as well get the guy who fills more other categories too. Is what I'm trying to make the point. You might as well. I mean, it depends there, on what's on the waiver wire. <laughs> there's yeah. there's only so much you can do on the waiver wire. Um, yeah, I don't know. Jacoby Ellsbury is apparently stealing again, so Ew. he's an option. Ew. Kill it with fire before he lays eggs. <laughs> he's already laid plenty of eggs. I'm, I'm sure of that. Uh, ben Revere, also good option out there. Ben Revere still plays regularly. For the, the Angels? He's, he's doing it. I mean, you really are not banking on any power, for sure, for picking oh, up Ben Revere. Yeah, that's some hard-hitting analysis right there. I um, try. <laughs> you try. Hernan Perez is another guy who might even be taking more at bats away from from Broxton if Broxton's not getting the job done. Um, you know, these are guys that are probably out there in most leagues, I would say. Apparently there's a there's a base there's a person who plays baseball, major league baseball, named Cesar Puello or Puello. 
and he plays for the Angels. This is weird. He's he, he's, he's played in one game recently, and he's on the player radar because he had in that one game he played, he stole two bases against Baltimore. That's hilarious. It's actually hilarious in my opinion. <laughs> I love baseball. I love baseball too. Cesar Cesar Pueyo got a name mention on uh, on on anything. The the fact that somebody said his name is just baffling to me. Uh, we're about <laughs> ready to wrap up our our podcast though. Uh, a few weekend matchups that are that are going to be fun ones to watch. Boston is going to New York uh, for a classic old Red Sox Yankees rivalry. Uh, we'll see Severino in that series. I'm excited for that. Um, I don't. I think Sale misses the series though, by one game. The Yankees offense is hitting like straight dookie lately, so I actually would be very interested in streaming a Red Sox pitcher in, a, in this matchup. Yeah, which I think I, most maybe, people would be surprised to hear. Maybe not Pomeranz against Severino, but definitely like Eduardo Rodriguez against Jaime Garcia. Oh, Sale is going Sunday. He he is on track to start Sunday. Um. Yeah, you got to use them there. So, yeah, that's that's an option there. Another series that is pretty relevant is Chicago going to Arizona. I love love those hitters' parks, and and the Cubs are definitely trying to figure out something to get into a groove. Wilson Contreras seemed to be that nice piece to push him there, and now he's gone. We'll see how they bounce back from that. Uh, I'm not too intrigued by the pitchers in this one. Um, I'm not going to use Lester this weekend, even though he's been pretty good lately. Um, he's going against Corbin on Saturday and Jake Arietta against Zach Godley at Chase Field might, might be a pretty good matchup. Actually, I might even go Godley's way in that one. Godley's been really good. Dude, that guy's going to be super underrated player so far. Yeah, last, his last start, I think wasn't very good. Um, and now that he's back in a hitter's park, even might not be good for him not, not a step forward for any pitcher um but the bats for sure i'll take i'll take some some bats any day i'll take me some paul goldschmidt and jd martinez against john lester absolutely uh considering considering what uh what uh paul goldschmidt did to the cubs at wrigley uh last time they played he hit like he went like eight for ten something like that something crazy he had a three home run game in the mix there so that's the other big one, I think. Los Angeles is in Seattle for a four-game set. They played the first game of that today. And Mike Trout hit a go-ahead three-run double. Mike Trout is forever going to be the Mariners' killer, I guess. The Mariners don't really have any pitchers that intrigue me. Um, and I don't, I don't really like using pitchers against Seattle because they have a pretty good offense with Nelson Cruz and Cano and you know Seager, who's still pretty good. Corey's brother is, you know... Pretty good, I would say. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a lot of intrigue in that series, but I, I figured I'd mention it because it's an important playoff series. So there you go. That's going to do it for our podcast today. We'd very much appreciate any feedback you have. Uh, you can leave comments or reviews anywhere you listen to this. You can tweet us at WPB underscore podcast. We'd really like for you to ask your uh, fantasy baseball questions and we'll answer any questions you have here on the podcast as well and yeah twitter is a great way to do that um, carrier pigeon also is accepted yes in in certain states um <laughs> that's important the porn detail sorry sorry for all you uh, international folks who are trying to, to send carrier pigeons our way we're working on it. Uh, any other way you can think to contact us will be in the description as well. I'd also recommend that you check out our website, which the link is also in the description. We have all our podcasts there as well as some new articles every single week. So, you know, in terms of fantasy baseball, I do most of the fantasy baseball articles there. Um, my last one was about sneaky home run hitters. Um, one of which has already hit the DL. Thanks, Wilson Contreras, even though he was looking pretty good on that front. Uh, so, yeah, there's more stuff coming there. Keep a lookout for that. And, yeah, that's going to do it for our show today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. As always, Rude. Peace.